Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 19, The Death of Alexander. In 325 BCE, when Alexander returned to Persia after campaigning in the eastern Persia Empire for almost half a decade, he found the generals he appointed to rule over his new empire were in fact looting the gold from their sacred temples and treating the Persians like a conquered enemy instead of their new empire to govern over fairly. This angered Alexander to the core because it went against his new philosophy of uniting the Greek and Persian people as a single race. He immediately executed the viceroys he found guilty sparking further outrage among his people. In 324 BCE, Alexander's goal was to unite the Greek and Persian race into one unified people, both culturally and genetically. To do this, he ordered almost 100 of his noblemen to take Persian wives and impregnate them. Alexander wasn't just talking about uniting all of the Greeks in all the Hellenic world. He wanted to unite all of mankind into a single race, sort of like Cyrus before him. All these stories taught to him by Aristotle really messed with his ego. Alexander himself married two Persian princesses, strengthening his bond between Persian and Greek. He also ordered that 30,000 youth throughout the Persian Empire be called upon for military service and trained to fight in the Macedonian phalanx. His goal was to conquer the entire world. When Alexander and his men returned to the city of Opus, near modern-day Baghdad, he ordered many of his tired and old soldiers to return to Greece. The Greek army felt like this was the final straw and they mutinied against Alexander. The 13 senior officers who led the mutiny were captured and executed. This stunt really angered Alexander and he felt betrayed by his men. Doing what he was best at, maybe second best, Alexander the Great gathered all of his army and gave a speech. The speech went a little like this. What I am about to tell you is not to convince you to stay. I shall start with my father Philip. When he found you, you were just peasants, wearing hides, and tending to your sheep in the mountains. You could barely defend them against your neighbors. Under my father you began living in cities, behind walls and doors. He turned you from slaves into the lords over those who used to plunder your land. Philip conquered Thrace, taking the mines and creating trade, giving you wealth. The Thessalians used to terrify you and your families. Now we rule over them. The Thebans and the Athenians used to terrorize us and extract tribute from us. Now they look to us for protection. My father went to the Peloponnese and put their house in order. He was crowned the ruler of all the Greeks and created a league that would see all of our people get rid of the Persian threat that has threatened our freedom and livelihood for centuries. This is what my father did for you. Great enough on its own, but this is small compared to what you have gained from me. I crossed the Hellespont, and even though the waters were still controlled by the Persian fleet, I defeated the satraps of the king of kings, Darius III, and made you rulers over Ionia, Lydia, and Phrygia. I conquered Miletus by land, and now all of their wealth is yours. I marched into Egypt, and was handed control over all of the riches of Cyrene and Egypt, without losing a single man in combat. Palestine, Syria, Mesopotamia, Babylon, they all belong to you now. Their gold is your gold now. You are satraps, captains, and generals. What have I held back from myself other than the purple cloaks. Nothing. I have entrusted all of these riches for you. What would I do with these riches anyways? I eat what you eat. I sleep as much as you. Many nights I've stayed up on watch so you can get your rest. If you have scars, strip down and show them to me. I'll show you mine. There isn't one part of my body that isn't covered in scars. I have been cut with swords, knives, arrows, clubs, sticks, and stones. Yet here I am, still leading you as the conqueror of land and sea. We have celebrated weddings together. Many of our children will be cousins. I have even paid off all of your debts without asking how you made them, despite the fact that you were already extremely well paid. Many of you wear golden crowns. Any one of us who was killed gloriously in combat was given a proper burial, and their families respected and exempt from taxes back home. Not a single man has been killed fleeing the enemy. Now I want to send some of you back who have been wounded or have grown old to be welcomed back at home with open arms as heroes. And this offends you now? Instead of some of you going, now you all wish to go? So I say go. 
Go home. Go home and tell your families about how your king conquered the Persians, the Medes, the Bactrians, and the Scythians. Your king who now rules over the Parthians. Your king who marched over the mountains of the Hindu Kush. Your king who crossed over the Indus River. I would have crossed over the Hypasus as well had you not cowarded in fear. Your king who sailed into the Indian Ocean at the mouth of the Indus River. Who marched across the deserts of Gedrosia. When you get home and tell this story, make sure to tell your family that you abandoned your king when he made it back to Susa. Leaving him with the Persians whom you had just conquered. Perhaps this report of yours will seem glorious in the eyes of men and worthy in the eyes of the gods. Be gone. Now after Alexander gave this speech, his army begged him for forgiveness. When Alexander made it back to Ecbatana, his most trusted friend and ally, Hephaestion, died of a fever. This wasn't just a good buddy. This was Alexander's best friend, who had been with him right from the beginning and never left his side. When Alexander lost his friend, he lost his mind and went into a deep mourning. He even ordered that the entire empire mourn for the loss of his friend. Alexander was grief-stricken. He went days without eating. In 323 BCE, when Alexander returned to Babylon, after winning one more war against a tribal kingdom in the mountains that not even the Persians were able to subdue, he was greeted by emissaries, sent to the capital from all across the known world. He was visited from Iberians, which is Spain, the Gauls, which is France, Etruscans, northern Italy, Lucanians, southern Italy. The world recognized him as the greatest emperor the world had ever seen. Back home, his new Persian wife was now pregnant and he was expecting an heir to his empire. And he began to make plans for his future campaigns into the Arabian desert, where he intended to secure all the points of trade along the Silk Road. Unfortunately for him, he developed a fever. And in 323 BCE, Alexander died. He was only 32 years old, and to this day no one knows exactly what killed him. There are many possibilities from typhus, malaria, or cholera. However, he very well could have been poisoned. And there is a saying that poison was always a woman's choice of murder, which leads some to speculate he was killed by his wife. Whatever the cause was, Alexander was dead, and the largest empire the world had ever known was about to be fractured. When Alexander died, he had no successor. The largest empire in the world was now leaderless, and there was nothing uniting them together. It was quickly decided that Alexander's half-brother would rule jointly with Alexander's unborn child, assuming that baby was going to be born a boy. Now the Diadochi were the men who had ridden into battle with Alexander, and were now governors and satraps over their own provinces in the great Hellenic Empire. They knew Alexander personally, and the last Diadochi died in 281 BCE, making this era known as the Diadochi period. The shadow of Alexander the Great cast so far that his immediate successors would do everything in their means to imitate his behavior. The legend that was Alexander was so great that his generals would try to look like him in paintings, and would even fake hunting frescoes where they were standing next to Alexander. He was so famous and legendary that he was almost godlike. Alexander was a brave leader who always led the charge into battle, and this would have lasting consequences for Greek warfare. The Macedonian veterans, who had just finished fighting for nine long years in Asia, were adamant that whoever replaced Alexander as the emperor, he better make sure he paid all the troops what they were promised by Alexander. After all, they had done all of the fighting and were not going to leave without their riches. Also, they wanted to get paid before the next leader spent all of the gold fighting a civil war. These veterans had a strong influence on the events immediately following Alexander's death as they were extremely loyal to the dynasty of Alexander the Great. When Alexander died, he had no legitimate male heir. He had a bastard, Heracles, with a Persian woman. He was only two years old. Alexander's wife was pregnant with his child. There was also a mentally challenged half-brother of Alexander's living in Babylon. Not to mention his mother Olympia was still alive, as well as two of Alexander's sisters and a niece. All of these people would play a role in taking some of the Hellenic pie for themselves. 
Alexander's generals play a major role in the wars that were about to come. Most of them were Alexander's age and had been his friends since school with Aristotle on that high palace in Greece. They were educated like Alexander and they had also been fed the story of the Iliad, making them think they were also descendants of the great heroes from old. At first the generals were all very loyal to Alexander's legacy, but very quickly it became clear that there could only be one. The fact that Alexander was planning his next military campaign into Arabia meant that his entire army was in Babylon, including all of his generals. Alexander's very last act before dying was to hand over his signet ring to his general, Perdiccas. So he presided over the assembly of army officials. In 323 BCE, Roxana gave birth to a baby boy. His name was Alexander IV. Perdiccas was named regent over the child's reign until he came of age and was able to rule by himself. As soon as word of Alexander's death made it to the corners of the empire, revolts broke out. In the province of Bactria, the people rioted, and in Athens they declared independence from Macedonian hegemony. Perdiccas dispatched the local governor to crush the Bactrians, as well as the governor of Macedon to crush the Athenians. In 322 BCE, the uneasy truce between Perdiccas and the other generals broke down. He knew he had to do something to strengthen his legitimacy, so Perdiccas arranged himself to be married to Princess Nicaea, the daughter of the Macedonian governor Antipater. The princess began an incredibly long journey from Macedon to the center of Babylon. And while she was on this journey, Perdiccas was on campaign in Anatolia in the province of Cappadocia, which still had some remnants of the Persian military. Now after crushing the Persian loyalists, Perdiccas returned to Babylon. All this time his bride-to-be, Nicaea, was nearing the capital. However, a messenger told Perdiccas that Alexander's sister, Cleopatra, desired Perdiccas's hand in marriage. And this was a lot to think about. His fiance was going to arrive any day now, and he had just received an offer of an even more valuable marriage alliance one that would make him directly tied into Alexander's dynasty. Now, because he did not want to anger the general Antipater, Perdiccas married Nicaea, although he did so begrudgingly. However, he could not let go of the opportunity to marry Alexander's sister and strengthen his claim to the throne. So he sent secret messages to Cleopatra telling her he was going to discard his current wife and marry her as soon as he could. Now, unfortunately for Perdiccas, this letter was intercepted by a man who was not very fond of him. He took the letter and sailed across the Aegean Sea straight to Antipater, who was just putting down the Athenian rebellion. Antipater was outraged at the way Perdiccas was planning to discard his very own daughter and gathered his Macedonian forces, as well as all of the allies in mainland Greece, including the governor of the province of Egypt, and Alexander's close friend from school with Aristotle and companion during the Great War, the General Ptolemy. In 321 BCE, as agreed during the military assembly, Perdiccas had arranged for Alexander's body and gold sarcophagus to be sent home to Greece. This caravan was crossing through northern Syria when they were intercepted. Ptolemy's men had captured the sarcophagus and transported it into Egypt. At the same time, Antipater's army began to cross the Hellespont. Perdiccas received both of these terrible pieces of news at the same time and decided to go straight to Egypt and confront Ptolemy while he dispatched an army to deal with Antipater. In the summer months of 321 BCE, Perdiccas' army made it to the edge of the Nile River. Standing on the opposite bank of the Nile was Ptolemy and his army, preventing him from crossing the water. With Antipater marching through Lydia, he needed to wrap things up in Egypt as fast as possible. Perdiccas marched his troops upriver during the night, hoping to be able to cross and get a sneak attack in against Ptolemy's army. Perdiccas' army made it to the nearest fortification along the Nile and just needed to cross the river and seize the fort before Ptolemy's army realized they were gone and caught up to them. He deployed his Indian war elephants at the front of the line, and his army made it across the Nile River. As his elephants crossed the river, Ptolemy's army arrived on the spot and re-fortified the fortress, guaranteeing a difficult and bloody battle for Perdiccas. Despite sending all of his best men and war elephants at the gates of the city, Ptolemy's troops were successful in defending the fortification, forcing Perdiccas and his army to march elsewhere to recoup. 
Perkis was now marching his troops up the Nile River, approaching the city of Memphis, desperate to find a way across the river. The river was faster and more dangerous as far up. A brilliant plan of marching all the elephants into the water to slow down the river was hatched, and at first it appeared to be working. The elephants and then a line of cavalry waded across the river, and the water was calm enough to allow a division to cross the river and make it to the little island in the middle. Unfortunately, the elephants started to sink in the mud and they were forced to escape the water, abandoning the soldiers on the narrow island and leaving the bulk of his army still trapped on the wrong side of the river. There was no chance in getting his army across here. And Perdiccas was forced to order the remaining soldiers cross back from the small island in the middle of the river. Unfortunately, the waters were fast and only the strongest of swimmers made it back alive. The Nile River is also home to some of the world's largest crocodiles, and it didn't take long for them to notice the men in the water. Many of these soldiers were snatched up while trying to cross back, and Perdiccas had suffered a humiliating defeat after humiliating defeat. And finally, his generals had enough, and one night they snuck into his tent and stabbed him to death. By this time, Antipater and his allies were marching through Anatolia. The next in line under Perdiccas was the general Eumenes. Now Eumenes was stationed in Anatolia, not too far from Antipater. In fact, Antipater only had to detour his army by a mere hundred miles or more, and he could wipe Eumenes off the map. One of Eumenes' generals betrayed him, fought several of his men, and then fled to join Antipater, which heavily influenced Antipater's next decision. With the odds now stacked firmly against Eumenes, Antipater decided it would be best to carry on his journey to Babylon. He left one of his top generals, Craterus, and a small army to deal with the threat that remained with Eumenes. And only ten days after Eumenes' general betrayed him, he ended up facing against Craterus himself in combat. Craterus was the most famous general in all of Greece. Nobody could beat this guy. And to prevent his men from mutinying and joining Craterus, Eumenes never told his soldiers that they were going to be fighting this general. Instead, they were told that they were going to be fighting the traitor general who had just betrayed them only 10 days before. Now, Eumenes placed his Asian and Thracian soldiers on the left flank, guaranteeing that they would be the ones to face off against Craterus instead of his Macedonian troops. Now Craterus knew that his fame and honor would work very well against the Macedonians, and he decided that it would be best for him to take the high ground on the hill so that every Greek in the battlefield would look up, see him, and run to him to join him. Unfortunately, the Asians and Thracians that Eumenes placed on his left flank didn't feel that way about Craterus. And as soon as he exposed himself on the hilltop, the left flank charged. And on top of that hill, Craterus and his men were slaughtered. At the same time, Eumenes led his own charge from the far right flank. And his cavalry charged the traitor general who had betrayed him only ten days before. There were now two cavalry battles taking place at the exact same time on the far sides of the battle. Yet the two infantry lines in the center, they never even started charging each other yet. That's how fast this battle took place. This strategy was hard on the cavalry and relied on brute killing power. This was all to keep the infantry in the center from finding out exactly who it was they were fighting. And the fighting was so brutal on the sides that most men on either side were killed. And in the chaos, the two generals sought each other out. And after spotting each other's armor, they engaged and fought each other in single combat. Eumenes stabbed his traitor general in the chest. And against all odds, Eumenes came out of this battle victorious. Now it's safe to say the only thing that made him uh, victorious in this battle was his uh, strategy of never letting his troops see who it was that they were fighting. In 320 BCE, Antipater made it to the heart of the empire, Susa. At the great city, Antipater declared himself the new ruler of the empire, replacing Perdiccas. There were many generals who were too ambitious to let Antipater claim the throne for himself, so he needed to deal with them first. 
Antipater sent his most trusted ally Antigonus to go crush Eumenes. While Antigonus marched from Babylon to Anatolia, Eumenes tried very hard to muster up more supporters. He went to Perdiccas's brother, who was also stationed in Anatolia, and together they created a coalition strong enough to defeat Antigonus, which was perfect timing too because Antigonus was just about to cross the gates from Syria to Anatolia. Now these gates are a narrow pass between two mountain chains that all armies are forced to cross between in order to make it from Anatolia to Syria. So it was very predictable. If an army was advancing on you, they were going to come through this narrow pass. And unfortunately, the two men couldn't agree who was going to lead the army. Unable to come to an agreement, Eumenes was forced to abandon his new coalition and fight Antigonus on his own. When Antigonus caught up to Eumenes, it was a slaughter. Some of his men even betrayed him and switched sides to join Antigonus. He was encircled and lost all of his infantry. Eumenes barely escaped on horseback with a small force of very close allies. While trying to pass through the gates from Anatolia back into Syria, Eumenes was surrounded by Antigonus. Now instead of slaughtering him on the spot, Eumenes was given the chance to bend the knee and swear allegiance to Antipater. Knowing that he had no other choice to bend the knee or die, Eumenes agreed to surrender. He was apprehended and sent north while they sent a messenger to Antipater awaiting his response. In 319 BCE, Antipater returned to Macedonia after a long campaign in Asia. He was a new regent of Alexander's empire and he was going to rule it from home, returning the capital of the empire to Pella, the capital of Macedonia. By this time in our story, Antipater is 80 years old and dies shortly after arriving home from the war. Once again, the future of the empire is in jeopardy as Alexander's son is still just a small child. Back in Anatolia, Antigonus was wiping up the last remnants of rebels, including Perdiccas' brother. After crushing them, he traveled north to the capital of Lydia. When he heard that Antipater died in Macedonia, it meant that the decision to spare Eumenes rested upon him. He, of course, spared Eumenes and even offered him the governorship of Cappadocia, but the most generous offer was to be Antigonus' second in command. In 318 BCE, Polyprican became the governor of Macedonia replacing Antipater. However, Polyprican wanted more than to be governor. He wanted to replace Antipater as regent over the empire. But he was all the way in Macedonia. He needed support if he was going to have a legitimate claim to the empire. He needed the support of Eumenes. Unfortunately, Polyprican was trapped in Macedonia as Cassander, the son of Antipater, had his own little army and planned to take the seat as governor by force. Cassander sailed across the Hellespont and sought Antigonus. Together they came to an agreement to rid Polyprican from the throne of Macedonia and co-rule as regents over the empire. There was no way for Polyprican to win against these two, not without the help of Eumenes, so he sent a message across Anatolia to Eumenes himself and offered him the king's general, the highest position in the entire empire. This won him over and Eumenes switched sides. Cassander and Antigonus planned their invasion of Macedonia when Eumenes broke off and marched to the city of Corinda in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea, where Syria joins with Turkey. In this city, Polyprican had granted him access to the treasury, as well as command of Alexander's personal infantry unit, the Silver Shields. By the time Antigonus heard of this treachery, his plan to invade Macedon was put on hold. He marched to Corinda, but Eumenes had already fled across Syria to the capital city of Susa, where he met up with the eastern governors who were willing to support him. In 317 BCE, Eumenes found himself commanding the largest army since the empire's formation, consisting of Greeks, Persians, Bactrians, and Indians, all of the major armies of the eastern provinces. However, Antigonus was in hot pursuit this entire time, gathering allies as he marched across the northern provinces of the empire. These two armies met at a river where Antigonus was letting his army cross a small bridge when they were ambushed on the other side. Eumenes surrounded 6,000 soldiers who had crossed the bridge, killing some and taking the rest prisoner. Antigonus was forced to retreat and ran north along the Zagros Mountains. He then marched his army around the backs side of the mountain chain 
with the intention of circling about and reattacking Eumenes from the south. It took weeks for his troops to march around the mountains, and eventually, Eumenes received word of Antigonus's advancement from the back side of the mountains, and he marched his army to the southern pass to intercept him and meet him in battle before Antigonus could surprise attack him. Now this battle was lined up like every other Greek battle in history so far, with cavalry on both ends of an insanely long phalanx made up of tens of thousands of infantry with 18-foot spears. However, the secret weapon in this battle wasn't longer spears or elephants. It was the silver shields, the personal soldiers of both Alexander the Great and Philip II of Macedon. They were the masters of the craft. Even though a lot of them were in their late 50s and 60s, these men turned the tides of the battle and crushed the infantry in front of them, winning this battle for Eumenes. Antigonus escaped the battle after taking heavy damage, but he was forced to retreat. Eumenes lost 500 men, while Antigonus lost over 4,000 of his soldiers. In 316 BCE, Antigonus went all in and marched his entire army south in the winter behind the Zagros Mountains in another attempt to surprise attack Eumenes. Normally a commander would at least let his army rest over the winter and prepare for invasion in the spring, but by then his enemies would be expecting him. Antigonus knew that this surprise attack was his only chance of defeating Eumenes. Unfortunately for Antigonus, Eumenes learned of his approach and had enough time to line his soldiers up for battle on the plains north of the Zagros Mountains in modern-day Iran. When the battle started, not only was it freezing cold, but there were over 10,000 soldiers lined up in a Macedonian phalanx with over 50 Indian war elephants leading the charge. Eumenes wanted a crushing blow dealt to Antigonus, so he placed himself, his elite cavalry, and the silver shields all on the left flank so they would be face to face with Antigonus himself. When the charge was given, the elephant stampeding across the battlefield picked up a large dust cloud that blurred the battlefield. Antigonus saw an advantage and sent his left flank around the entire battlefield to plunder Eumenes' supply carts. When Eumenes and his war elephants made it to the phalanx, most of them were skewered on the large pikes. The fighting went terrible and most of them were killed. Desperate to escape, Eumenes fled back to his phalanx, who started to make it across the battlefield. These were, of course, the silver shields, and the silver shields marched out of the dust cloud in perfect formation with the utmost discipline and rolled right over the opposing army that was disorganized and still recovering from the elephant charge. Eumenes was celebrating with his men after the most amazing victory over the scattered soldiers of Antigonus when they discovered their supply carts were captured. This wasn't as simple as a few wagons. This was the very livelihood of the silver shields, their wives and children, all they owned. Their entire home was in those supply carts and now Antigonus had it. That very night, the silver shields carried Eumenes across the battlefield, kicking and screaming, and handed him over to Antigonus. That night, Eumenes was executed, and another great general who fought with Alexander was dead. Antigonus was now the most powerful man in the empire. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the History of Modern Greece. See you next time. Stay safe and stay awesome.